23. I'd ask everyone to please stand and join uh, Vice President Seaberg and the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Thank you. Roll call. Mrs. Jackson? Here. Mr. Holmquist? Here. Mrs. Farley? Here. Mrs. Spence? Here. I am also present. Vice President Siebert? Here. And President Arnold? Present. All present and accounted for. Thank you. First order of business, public comment. Do you have any public comment this evening? We just have one. All right, we have one. Mr. Johnson? Information sheets and they're uh, sitting there for anybody who looks. I can't go through all this information uh, in three minutes, but my speed reading is not I'm just not. Uh, also, initially, I want to thank you for hearing me, and uh, I also wanted to say that I had submitted in December a request for public records information, and I have not received any information back on that. I just want to email, so I didn't you know, start about that. Uh, tonight's uh, comment was concerning the uh, gender identity policies. The DEI programs and the advocates for youth. Uh, my summary of those comments that I'm going to just try to kind of quickly go through is that what positive results in academics, mental health, and well being have been demonstrated by the policies and programs such as the DEI, CSE, and other gender information uh, programs? So, uh, the information that I have here, the second sheet, and I'm not going to go over that much, I was trying to look up information pertaining to the Executive Order uh, 139 to 88 pertaining to how that affects and changes or alters the uh, 1975 uh, law, the Family Education Rights and Privacy Act. And I don't see, I'm not a lawyer, I don't have no legal ease, but I can't see where that changes anything, where it's the parental rights of the parent uh, to be informed of anything that's going on with their parent. Okay, so and that's there, and you guys probably don't know about that, I do, but I sure would like to know what the laws are and, and federal law versus the uh, executive order. Then the other thing I had was the uh, Comprehensive Sexual Education Program. These uh, this notes here is from two former sex educators, Monica Klein and Audrey Werner. Through the SEL program, the Comprehensive Sexual Education Program, kids are taught how to practice safe sex. It's your name program. Talks about how to use a condom using role playing practice. Um, Planned Parenthood works with these teachers to uh, the S CSE to teach the children to have safe, safe sex. Then further on, on the comments here. Uh, these materials might be considered obscene according to the obscenity laws in most states, but because of exemptions to schools, libraries, and uh, museums, this material is allowed to be given to children. Attempts to repeal these obscenity exemptions, which several states have done that, both here and in Nebraska, those have failed to go through. Uh, then also, therefore, the children are being exposed to this material in schools across the country that I couldn't have access to myself uh, through social and emotional learning programs and reading material not part of the curriculum. These programs, unlike the curriculum, are not subject to review by the parents. Then just in final synopsis from the material that I 
that I wanted to share with you is that from the site, the Advocates for Youth site, which is where the uh, comprehensive sexual education programs can be accessed. I understand if this is wrong, let me know, because I'm just looking at what I see that's out there. Uh, there's the Advocates for Youth site, which says, the new youth activist toolkit was developed with youth writers and activists to be detailed guide to help young people develop a plan, organize a coalition, and define and implement strategies to achieve measurable social impact goals. Young people understand that reproductive and sexual health and rights are inexplicably tied to social justice and the fight for liberation. Join thousands of <coughs> youth activists and adult allies as we build a better and more equitable world. Then the Amazed Youth program, which has several videos and I just pulled up the title to some of them, so here are some of them. My friend is a transgender. I think I might be bisexual. I think I might be lesbian. These are all different videos. I think I might be gay. I think I might be asexual. How to use a condom. Through the Amazed Youth Program, they are initiating the Amazed Youth Ambassador Program online animated sex education series is conducting a nationwide search for young people aged 10 to 16 to become ambassadors of the project. I'm sorry, I just don't think it's right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. And you, did you leave your handouts over there on the uh, media table? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Anybody at the board who would like to pick up a copy of what you said? Thank you. Next order of business is the consent agenda. We have one additional item to be added to the personnel agenda addendum at the bottom of personal recommendation and travel requests. So we'll be covering approval of the minutes for the January 9th, 2003 school board meeting. Approval of the minutes for January 9, 2023, or reorganizational meeting. Approval of the minutes of the January 9, 2023, Board of Finance meeting. Approval of the minutes of the January 23rd, uh, 2023, Special Executive Session. Financials and ratification and approval of February 13, 2023. The Treasurer's Report, of January 2, uh, 2023. And the personal recommendations and travel requests. And before we vote on that, I'd like to have a motion and approval of the board to add the, the uh, personal agenda addendum. You will pass out. So moved. So moved. Thank you, Vice President. Second. And Jennifer, thank you. We have a motion and approval. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Pass 7 0. So, with the consent agenda now having been read and suggested, do I have a motion to pass? So moved. Vice President, thank you. Second. And Secretary, thank you. We have a motion approval. Any discussion? All those in favor? Signify aye. 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 Seven zero. President Arnold, if I could. Yes. Uh, with, thank you for your support uh, on the consent agenda and having approved that this evening. Uh, there are a couple key appointments that uh, would like to bring <coughs> forward here or make public and that is the fact that the uh, official approval was here tonight for a football head football coach for the Port High School, and that's Bob James. And as well, we have a key position, our maintenance facility um, assistant director, and that's Terry Poynton. And many of you know Terry has him, having worked at Trevor Field, and uh, we we're also happy to announce that Matt Stahl will be replacing Terry Poynton and being in charge of Shriver Field maintenance. Thank you for your support on those things. Thank you. Any members of the board have anything to <coughs> say? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fred Stone. Next, we have no old business to re uh, report. The superintendent, would you like to give your report? Yes, I would. Thank you. We are pleased to have quite a few of our teachers being awarded uh, teacher grants from the LaPorte Education Foundation. And to present those this evening is Tirsa Shabel. Tirsa. Good evening. I'm Tirsa Shabel, the principal at Critchfield Elementary, and I also serve on the Port Educational Development Foundation uh, board. Uh, part of my duties is to award uh, teacher grants, and something we look forward to every year because. Um, as you can see, these teachers are very dedicated, and we very much appreciate that they're all here. <coughs> they write these grants to allow for some creativity in their classrooms that are not um, normally able to um, always be funded. And so uh, because of our generous um, donations throughout the turkey trot that we have every November, um, we're able to have about 22 awards this evening. And so when I call your name, if you would please come up and then just stand over to the side, collect your certificate. 
um, and they'll get a picture at the very end. Um, and, and if you would wait till the end, I do have several that, that we're not able to attend. To start with, James Bolzorek from LaPorte High School, as well as Don Varda. <coughs> Charity Oliver from LaPorte Middle School for Empty Bowls Project. And Bonnie DeWolf for Sewing Up the American Revolution. Uh, Tracy Mann and Kristen Ulrich for Ulrich, excuse me, for uh, Kessling Intermediate School PBL and Room Transformations. Amy Hancock from the Kessling Campus uh, in recognition for the Victory Garden. Megan Haversack in third grade team for building up STEAM in third grade. Uh, the kindergarten team at Critchfield. Allie West, Lisa West, Alice Tallickson, and Lynette Cappison for Purposeful Play. The second grade team from Kingsbury Elementary, Stephanie Kaiser and Jill Kaufman for Kingsbury Literacy Project. Taylor Sass from Kingsbury for Rooted in Reading Books. Uh, Maria Morrill Amor from Lincoln Elementary for building a book <coughs> library, as well as Marcia Aragon from Lincoln. Uh, Sheila Reisig for, uh, from Riley Elementary for profit <coughs> multiplication charts. Esmeralda Vargas from Highland Elementary for supporting our ELLs. <coughs> Lauren Dixon from Indian Trail for Come Up and Show Your Thinking, as well as Courtney Powley for Graphic Novels Galore, Brittany Huber from Hanley Elementary for Smeckin's Mentor Text, <coughs> as well as uh, Hannah Schroll, Sarah Ebersall, and Nicole Moore from Hanley Elementary for Hoosier Hungry for Books. Erin Lozano from Hanley Elementary for Young Authors. Uh, Jeanette James Raymond from our Little Learners Preschool for Big Science for Little Learners Continue. And then uh, the, the teachers that I knew were not able to be here tonight are Holly Wiles from Riley Elementary, um, Alexa Sponge from Heilman, and Jesse Davenport. Um, Alexis had Jessie. She left her baby for a few minutes. No, okay. she still has her baby. Um, so Alexis had us STEM bends as well. So again, congratulations to all these dedicated educators. First, I would I would like to say one thing. Thank you to the foundation, of course, for going up above and beyond. Uh, granting money to our staff who, who are themselves going above and beyond. If you're listening to some of the things we're highlighting here as far as their grants and the requests, all for things that are very solid regarding going above and beyond, project-based learning, ways to deliver education that students are in, interested in, uh, variations of approaches with students, hands-on learning, all these things are very much supported, making accommodations, and so hats off to all of our staff uh, for the extra work it takes to go after these things and to deliver, so thank you very much. Would like to have a picture here, and if you could come up, we're gonna have to get close here, but we wanna get you all in here, so might be a couple different levels. Yeah, maybe two or three rows. Right up in here.
So continuing on with my report, I would like to provide an update on our strategic planning process, progress at this point. Uh, this is a big week for us. Uh, since our last meeting, we've had a couple different planning team meetings. Tomorrow, we will be having a large group of close to 50 individuals, both from the community and from our staff, working together to narrow down specifically things that are coming out of our, out of our focus areas uh, in order to give us some data to work on to very specifically list initiatives and goals uh, from the ideas that are coming out of the categories of safety, curriculum, and community parent and staff engagement. So we're really excited about that. Uh, we're also narrowing down the mission, mission, vision, and values uh, for the corporation. And by the end of the year, again, we'll have a, a product that we'll be able to work towards over the next three to five years. So we're really excited about that. That concludes my report. Thank you, Dr. Franciscone. Any questions, comments from the board? Okay, next we'll have the elementary assistant superintendent, Dr. Tonigo. All right, good evening, everyone. I'm really excited to invite up to the podium some of our staff and representatives from Kingsford Heights Elementary School to do a school spotlight and some special STEM programming. So Mrs. Kozier, our principal, come up with your team, please. We, we lost the podium. <laughs> 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 I'm just getting it up there. Mm -hmm. Can you bring it back? You passed the first test. It's <laughs> like, it's, it's principal at Kingsford Heights. I have with me Sarah Seitz, our Project Lead the Way teacher. She serves both at Kingsford Heights and um, Heilman. And then I have Miss Sophia Nieto, and she is a student, has been our student since she was in preschool, and now she's in fourth grade. And so she will be your robotics ex expert to be able to answer any questions you might have, right? And she's ready to go. Um, we thought it might be um, uh, a good idea to share with you some of the um, uh, initiatives in video format so that you can kind of get a better idea of how we um, run our programming and what the kids are <coughs> engaged in. And then if you have questions after that, we can go ahead and answer questions for you. So I believe our video is like three or four minutes. Um, but, but in summary, we just uh, applied for IDOE STEM certification um, in October, end of October it was due. And then we just found out the um, beginning of January that we were classified as a um, developing STEM school, which means that gives us until the following October to put into place a few other important aspects of our application. Um, we are very appreciative of Miss Erin Meyer over here for helping us with our um, video uh, website we had to construct, which was pretty intense. Um, but we were really happy to learn these new things and see what's expected at the IDOE for becoming a STEM certified school. Um, by the way, in LaPorte County, there are only two STEM certified schools, one being Critchfield, and their certification ends um, this year, so they'll be starting recertification next year and the only other school within the county is Lake Hills Elementary School which is a part of um, Michigan City School um, School Corporation and they are a designated um, STEM school but they are a magnet uh, STEM school as well so um, anyway so that's kind of an interesting fact that there's only two two schools in the entire county and um, I think I read uh, the fact that um, 109 across the state of all schools, all age levels, 109 STEM certified schools out of almost 1,700 schools. So it's kind of a, you know, an interesting uh, achievement and, uh, you know, very important achievement. So um, we'll go ahead and start our program. You guys can take a look at that. <coughs>
that's what we've been up to over the past couple of years and more photos were still from when we were in COVID, but we did not stop learning STEM um, uh, activities and initiatives while we were in COVID. Did they? Um, so if anybody has any questions for Sarah regarding Project Lead the Way or Ms. Sophia, would you like to tell them how many years you've been? Come here, read your story. How you can come to Hello, my name is Sophia. Kinker Heights third and fourth grade students can join our robotics team. This year, we compete in two tournaments, one at Chesterton where we did it, and one at Kinker Heights Elementary. I have participated in robotics for two years. That's pretty good. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Ms. Korsha, how do you say you applied for STEM certification? We did. I'll let Sarah answer that because she was also she's our um, leader in that um, area. I'm the secondary leader, um, but she's very involved in the process. <laughs> so how long does it take to, get, to obtain that certification? Well, we, we we are not certified yet. We are um, progressing toward that. So that will be um, that. We have another year. Well, October we'll apply again, and um, hopefully. Uh, refine some things that didn't go so well in yeah. our application. Um, now that we know more about the process, because we really didn't know anything about the process going in, and learned a lot through through it. Um, but yeah, the application was just available through the IDOE, and they kind of gave us some guidelines. But um, until we got their feedback, we really didn't know um, much. Yeah, specifics. Now, now we can really. Um, Attack in a different way, I think. I'm really happy to see Rings of Life on it. My wife's been involved with Rings of Life about 18 years and she was out there today. And I'm really awesome. happy to see that being used because what an up and coming organization. Yeah. Um, our uh, STEM application to the IDOE, the whole process has changed a great deal in five years. So now there is this technological component with you having to develop, every school having to develop their own website and have all of their data, all of their documentation, all on uh, a, a created you know, website. Um, so for us, that was a new experience as well. When Critchfield did their certification five years ago, it was uh, submitted in documents, not electronically. So things have changed a lot. So even for us to go to our colleagues and talk about you know, how, you know, how did this go for you? How can we uh, take some advice from you? Um, it's it's completely different. So I, I kind of gather that they'll be asking us some questions coming up here as they start this whole process in October or, or next fall. And then we all submit our final um, products in October, end of October uh, for 2023. So hopefully we'll have some good news for you next school year as we get our final results back. Sophia, what's your favorite part of being in the robotics club? Um, Learning about how we're engineering and making different kind of robots and learning about different kind of things and how technology works. That's awesome. Very cool. Oh, so last year it was um, these balls that you have to launch up into a basket. But this year, it's this, you gotta shoot um, <coughs> this, the discs out, and if you touch where the discs are, then that's extra points. Cool. So each year, there is a new challenge that Vex Robotics gives to the kids. You need the new equipment that you have to purchase, and the kids have to learn the new challenge. The coaches have to learn the new challenge first so that they can help the kids along in the process. But it's all very exciting, as you can see from the pictures. That's, it's um, we're we're very excited at Kingsford Heights. Kingsford Heights to be one of the schools that um, uh, hosts a Vex Robotics tournament. It's a lot of work and a lot of time, um, but this is our fourth year doing it now. So we're kind of getting pretty decent at it. So we're pretty proud of that. 
Um, this year the teams went to um, Chesterton Intermediate as well, um, earlier in the year, so they learned a lot to bring it back to adjust, make adjustments to their robots, you know, figure out some things that they needed to do better, um, and then they would give, have that opportunity to make changes for the next tournament, and we had some pretty good results. So Pia's team was 11th. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, awesome. Mrs. Kozer and Mrs. Seitz, first of all, I'd like to thank you for modeling what it takes to take on these challenges for, for the children who are being challenged as well. Uh, you guys have been really working towards just challenging students in STEM for a number of years. Uh, this particular uh, de declaration of being a STEM certified school is just uh, one more challenge for you, but it's we're proud of you and proud of students like Sophia when we can see they're excited about what they're doing, learning things that uh, certainly are going to serve them well in the future. So thank you for your efforts. We're going to grab a picture. So thank you, Mrs. Kozer, Mrs. Seitz, and Ms. Sophia. We appreciate you presenting tonight. All right. Thank you very much for allowing thank you. us to thank share. You. Thank you. Thank you. One more item from my report. I'm going to be giving an update on our uh, playground space improvement projects through the Healthcare Foundation. And I have a uh, short presentation that I'm going to go over with you. Some of this is just historical, but since we have so many new board members, I'm going to repeat some information. Let's get set up here. So as she's setting that up, this is our second round of grants that we are applying for through the Healthcare Foundation. The first one was done in 2022, and we are still working on that. We're a little behind due to various um, um, interruptions in the supply chain and the weather and um, having uh, workers be able to, to do the installation, all that sort of thing. But we're not to be um, discouraged. The projects are moving on. So while those projects are finishing up, we also are continuing to forge ahead by applying for a new grant for um, three new schools. And so that's in the 2023 grant. And that's what I'm going to share with you. Thank you. All right, this chart right here shows a little bit of the um, amount of financial aid involved in the projects. The colors in green are the current projects that are going on right now, and that's Highland, Kingsbury, and Riley. The yellow projects are the new projects that we are um, applying for um, a letter of int intent right now through the Healthcare Foundation. So you'll notice up there, we, these are all estimated costs, but we have a, a grant cost from the Healthcare Foundation that we are requesting, and then we have um, some money factored in from our school PTAs or PTOs who have historically invested in some fundraising for these projects. So right now, Kingsbury, Heilman, and Riley are all um, involved in the installation of the new playgrounds. They all were delivered here in the last month, so all the equipment is on site. The old equipment is being removed, but we're being very careful not to pull it too quick because we don't want too much of a disruption for our kids. So right now, Riley's equipment has been removed. There's an excavator out there, and they are prepping the ground, and the installation crew is, is currently out there right now. Kingsbury will be next, followed by Heilman. This is the same installation crew that works on all three projects. So we're hoping this beautiful um, spring weather in February continues because that will help us kind of catch back up. Um, Heilman's a little bit different. We're doing a port service at Heilman, and so the weather really has to cooperate versus the, um, the surface of uh, the other schools, the mulch, the mulch surface. So that's a little different. That's why they're going last, and we're going to try to time that in the spring when, the, when real spring is here. All right, there's a couple pictures of Riley. On our left, um, it's right over by Weller Avenue, and on our right, that picture is behind the school. We're gonna swap our playgrounds and put our older playground, the two to five playground, 
up here near the road. Currently that was the pre-K to one playground, but we want to get the littles off the road and move them to the back. So we're going to be um, flipping those out. So there are really two new playgrounds coming in at Riley. There's our Kingsbury delivery sitting and waiting and the same thing with Heilman. So our three new schools, just to make a couple comments about those, we've got Critchfield um, first. Um, these projects were all prioritized according to a, a needs assessment. So annually we have a crew that comes out and does an inspection and um, lists the priorities of which equipment needs to be fixed. So how did we get the first three schools on the list? They were the most neediest schools. So these next three schools um, fall after that. Our corporation has historically provided the maintenance and um, the compliance factors with playgrounds. We have updated playgrounds anytime there's a major um, building project, but playgrounds are really expensive and they don't get upgraded uh, very often. We've had um, limitations with the amount of capital projects money that's available and there's lots of needs with parking lots and um, you know all kinds of maintenance and HVAC and those types of things. And so um, they kind of fall on the lower end of the priority list and so what we end up doing is fixing them constantly. Well, you get to a certain point when they're more difficult to fix and in the latest um, case with Kingsbury, um, we were told that some of these parts are just, you can't, you know, can't get them anymore. They're too hard to get, um, so you have to start replacing them. So these fundraisers have been going on for years and years and years at, at our schools because they've had a goal to up, update uh, playgrounds. I think Indian Trail was the last school to do their whole playground through a fundraiser. But, um, you know, the cost of these playgrounds are such right now, you know, if your child was in kindergarten when you started fundraising on the PTA or PTO, you might be 45 by the time your playground gets um, done. So I came in and looked at how do we, you know, accelerate this process. And the Healthcare Foundation of LaPorte has shared goals and initiatives and priorities that align with what we're trying to do. We want healthy kids, we want active kids, we want communities with um, space for families to get together and exercise and play and um, that sort of thing. So this was a good opportunity for us. Um, you can see Critchfield has, uh, looks like $25,000 right now in the bank ready to go and they're continuing to do some fundraising. So um, as prices go up, um, you know, we'll be getting quotes on these things and trying to make it all fit together. Uh, Lincoln has been another school in need thing I'll say about Lincoln is uh, traditionally it's been a school that's been closed off with a fence because of uh, maybe concerns with um, trespassers or vandalism or that sort of thing. These playgrounds are going to be accessible to the neighborhood um, during reasonable hours. We're going to have posted uh, signs that welcome the community into them during hours of operation. And We talked a lot about trying to align that with how we do our county parks. So getting verbiage that would uh, designate that space as being accessible um, sun up to sundown. I don't remember exactly how we phrased it on, on the signs, but the Healthcare Foundation entered into an MOU with our school board, with the last school board, saying that these would, uh, this space would be accessible to the community neighborhood. So we will be making sure that um, at Riley, at Lincoln, at Critchfield, all have um, access to these. Um, the one comment I'll make about Kingsford Heights, and probably should have had Mrs. Kozier uh, make this, but I call them space uh, improvements because it's not just about playgrounds. A lot of our um, schools have access to great green space, trails, um, you know, basketball courts, soccer fields, that sort of thing, trail. And so in the case of Kingsford Heights, they've been um, working on their trail for a little while, working with their playground or with their um, PTO, PTA to um, enhance the whole space across the whole ground. So uh, we're not just looking at um, the actual equipment slides and um, you know, swing sets and that sort of thing. We're looking at this holistically to get the community involved. So that's really exciting for them to be able to get some help because again, it's a really expensive project. Uh, one uh, question that, are pre that previously came up last year when I presented on this is why aren't we using ESSER dollars um, to do this sort of thing? ESSER dollars were focused on learning loss. That was our primary um, you know, interest in using ESSER dollars. There was a non-learning loss category for them, but we did some other things uh, with HVAC, um, bus purifiers, um, uh, all those sorts of things and so uh, we did not designate money for our playgrounds into our, our ESSER budget and that budget is posted online so you can see how that money is being spent. So right now our letter of uh, intent has been um, sent to the Healthcare Foundation and they will be reviewing it. Once they approve that then we will be doing a full grant application for those three schools. Um, if all goes well we would be looking to do the next three schools in the next cycle, the 2024 cycle. 
I'd be glad to answer any questions about the grant or any of the projects. A cold life span of the playground. I mean, I could probably do the math thinking about like how old Riley's playground is and Kingsbury's, but how long until a replacement is normal? They, they last a long time, and and they most of them are in place when the building was last right. renovated or or last built. Um, you can keep them going. You know, there's not a lot of moving parts on them. So as long as you can, you know, fix things that rust or you know the moving parts on swings, they can they can go for a long time. Yeah. So I don't know that I've ever been given a timeline on them. Um, I'll sh I can show you. Well, it's not on this one. The playground specs for 2023 are a lot more enhanced than they were in 1960 or 1970. So the yeah. playgrounds we're putting in are so much more engaging. So. Um, from that standpoint, you know, you're probably looking at 20 years and you probably need to start upgrading some of the equipment just to keep up with the local parks and, and that sort of thing. Yeah, I was just thinking about it from a standpoint of this, these grants are amazing and I was thinking like long term, but yeah. this should buy us 20 years or so. A long time. Yeah. yeah, right. Correct. Yeah, there's Riley right there. Oh, cool. Um, that is Kingsbury, I believe. And again, these are there's a, a little playground and a big playground for your lower grades and your upper grades. And then Heilman with the port surface right there. Very cool. Are we looking at port services for any of the three new ones? No. Port okay. surface at Heilman. Um, all are ADA accessible. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? That concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tango. <clears throat> okay, we'll move on now to the assistant superintendent. Um, you know, we've um, been talking a lot about our um, pathways at the uh, high school and the intermediate campus. Uh, the presentation tonight on Project Lead the Way uh, kind of leads into what our students and staff are doing right now, which is um, being able to choose their courses for experiences starting in fifth grade and then really a little more focused in seventh grade. So right now is the time uh, with our program of studies. Our schools are having parent meetings. They're meeting with the students. Um, they're sending the information home. So we would just encourage parents to really be looking at our course offerings as they're doing their schedules for next year. And um, February is um, Career Technical Education Month, and so I wanted to highlight this month with a presentation by our Director of Career Readiness, Jen Goss, so I'll have her come up, and um, I would like her to highlight our Health Careers um, Pathway. So you, you might recall before COVID, um, we actually applied for a Healthcare Foundation grant and started a Health Careers program at the high school. Um, it was a little difficult to do that virtually, um, but it was the first step in growing that program. Um, and at the time we were partnering with our uh, clinic and having the nurse practitioner as our instructor and had to make a few modifications on that. But this year we really um, kind of bounced back, um, reboosted what we were doing, we were able to hire an amazing instructor, um, Tabitha Hughes, for the Health Careers Program. Jen was able to recruit students last year who wanted to go into the health career field. And so we've started that program this year along with a lot of other excellent pieces. So I won't take her um, slides from her PowerPoint, but I'd like to introduce Jen Goss um, to share that information with you tonight. So thanks, Jen. Hello. Hi. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm Jennifer Gosselaar Health Sciences and um, what our goals are for the future. down into um, Health Science 1 and Health Science 2. During Health Science 1, students take uh, principles of healthcare, medical terminology, and healthcare specialists. Healthcare specialists is what students need to take in order to earn their CNA or their Certified Nursing Assistant uh, certification. So this course covers the fundamentals of careers in the health field, medical terminology, and the structure and function of the human body. All of these courses are dual credit, 
Um, Tabitha came to us ready to go with being dual credit certified, so that's awesome. Um, and so students will be earning their college credits while still in high school. Um, and then the Health Science II, which is the second year of it, that's their capstone. So the capstone is um, course, a course that will provide healthcare students with additional knowledge and skills necessary to work in a variety of healthcare settings um, beyond just long-term um, care facilities. So we, they can work in hospitals, doctors' offices, and clinics. Um, students can accomplish this goal by completing coursework that will cover topics such as medical law and ethics, electronic health records, and or behavioral health. So just a quick overview of what those are. Um, we've been very fortunate to have partnered with Northwest Health. Um, we're already working on some um, internship type opportunities for students that, that qualify um, to go into that in many different fields, phlebotomy to x-ray to surge tech. So we're working closely with them. Um, some future careers that students might be interested in, in pursuing in the CNA program or the health sciences program are registered nurse, CNA, phlebotomist, dental assistant, EMT, vet tech, x-ray technician, physician. Um, I've had students finish the program in other places that have gone on to like speech therapy or um, they're now, you might see them riding around in ambulances around the area because they went up to EMT school. Um, and then also some of our students are working at our local hospitals. So uh, Northwest Health has again been a big supporter um, of the inception of this program. We were invited to attend um, Student Surgical Day at Northwest Health. They created this specifically for LaPorte County students interested in health careers. Um, during this day, students will, will spend about two hours on the Northwest Hospital campus. They'll highlight three core, core roles of the operating room. They will experience the operating room and surgical procedure setup, and then they'll see a mock endoscopy suite. To be honest, I'm not really sure what that all means yet, but I will, I will let you know afterwards. I'm sure there will be lots of pictures taken. So HOSA, if you're not familiar, is used to be Health Occupation Students of America. It's a, it's a club or student-led organization that students in high school can join. Um, it's now called Future Health Professionals, but they're still using HOSA as the acronym. Um, when Tabitha came to us, she also wanted to start a HOSA program with the Health Science Program. And she has done that, and we have a wonderful group of students um, that are part of HOSA. So HOSA is a student-led organization, Empower HOSA members to become leaders in the global health community. Um, HOSA also promotes career opportunities. It enhances the delivery of quality health care to all people, and it works with their leadership development. So all of these students, well, most of those students, will be going um, to Indianapolis in April to go to their HOSA convention. Some of them will, might be competing um, in some different activities, like they do CPR, they do basic life support, those kinds of things. So we're very excited about our HOSA group. Um, HOSA's main objective is to have a community service project. They've chosen to do Project Adam. Um, if you're not familiar with Project Adam, it is a, my notes here, it's a heart safe school program. And there are currently five high schools in the state of Indiana that are certified through Project Adam. The closest one to us being New Prairie High School. Um, and so HOSA's goal is that by the end of the calendar year, 2023, Report High School will be a designated Project Adam heart safe school. Um, recently, New Prairie Middle School and Rolling Prairie Elementary School earned their Project Adam Heart Safe School designations. Um, Tabitha and I were invited to go and watch this, and it was very neat how it was put on. We were able to talk to HOSA students that were involved in the process. Um, we watched live drills. We met with a doctor from Riley Children's, um, as well as a, um, forget what you, a, a respiratory therapist from, from Riley. And they're very excited to work with LaPorte. Um, and we're going to go from there. So we have already started our checklist, and we're working on a lot of things. Um, New Prairie High School has um, offered to assist us with writing a certification plan, a safety certification plan, to get our um, safety team up and ready to go. Um, so HOSA students will be instrumental in this process. Like I said, HOSA student-led, um, and Project Adam really wants their students involved in this. And what they will be doing once LaPorte High School is deemed um, a heart safe school is that they will then work with our athletic and band students to be um, to get them CPR trained because unfortunately these um, sudden cardiac arrests happen during um, strenuous activity right they happen on the on the basketball court they happen on the football field they happen in often just places where kids are and so we want our students to be trained um, in how to 
how to assist with that because seconds save lives here. Um, so that's what our athletic, or our, sorry, our host of students will be doing. They'll be working with our athletic and band students, and every time a whole team gets CPR or an AED trained, they will receive a gold heart pin for their uh, letterman jacket. So I think Coach Josh offered baseball up first. <laughs> <laughs> So that is our goal for the next two years with HOSA. Do you guys have any questions for us? Okay. Thank you. Very cool. Thank you. Very good. Yes. Thank you. One of our many pathways that our students are involved in and um, just shows the diligence and the hard work of our leadership with doing all we can for the kids that are involved in those. So we really appreciate all the work that Jennifer's uh, done to bring all of those pieces together. So thank you to her. Um, just a few other highlights this evening. Um, I do want to make the public aware through our meeting that March 8th from 5 to 8 o'clock we will be doing parent-teacher conferences at LaPorte High School. Um, I hear there will be other exciting things going on for parents, so uh, we want to make that open for parents. And um, this Friday, between our um, JV and varsity basketball game, we will be uh, highlighting a few folks into the uh, Hall of Fame uh, at 4.30. So um, might have a celebrity among us here, but I won't point that out. Um, but uh, we want to uh, congratulate all of them, so we invite all of you out to the high school at 4.30 this Friday. We have a couple of students to highlight also. Um, several years ago, um, uh, colleges came together to offer a full tuition scholarship in what's called the Posse um, Scholarship, and it is a um, highly uh, competitive scholar designation. And we have a senior student, Pooja Verma, who has been awarded this um, scholar designation, so we are very excited and proud of her accomplishment with that. Um, and in the fine arts area, we had junior Zach Kepzinski, who was um, selected for the 2023 IBA All-Star Honor Band. So he had to um, audition for that, and um, it is um, a, an honor for us to have a student that is involved in that as well. Some highlights again with CTE. Um, many of you have seen Mr. Varda here with the high school radio and TV competition team. Last uh, weekend, the 4th of February, like two weekends ago now, the team won the Regional Skills USA competition in Elkhart, and they will be going to state competition this spring. So um, we are uh, congratulating them for that as well. And at our intermediate campus, just an event next week, they are having their cabin fever for all Kesslein families, so we'd like to um, encourage them to be at that. And then this is the time of year when we're looking at um, adoption of materials, so all of our buildings at the secondary have had teams of teachers involved in um, looking at health and science curriculum. So um, as they do that over the next few months, we will be bringing back a recommendation to the board for um, any information as we move forward with that. So again, happy CTE month this week or this month. Um, and um, if you have any questions about any of our pathways, we would be happy to answer those or uh, have you come in and just see all the great things that our kids are doing in those classes at the high school and the intermediate campus. So thank you. Question or comments for Dr. Larson? Thank you very much, Dr. Assistant Superintendent of Business and Operation, Mr. Hunt. Thank you, President Arnold. This evening, uh, there are two items on my report. The first of which is just an update on the General Assembly. Uh, I'm going to go over a couple of the bills that are uh, being discussed um, in committee and things are starting to move. We're getting, I talked to, to President Arnold a little bit about this. We're getting towards the halfway point, and that's when things start to really uh, take shape as far as some of these bills are concerned. I uh, want to start with the House Ways and Means Committee. Uh, a couple of bills that I wanted to bring to your attention, one of which is House Bill uh, 1454, which is also known as the Department of Local Government Finance Bill. Uh, one of the things that I'm very interested in I think it's going to benefit the school corporation is the possibility of increasing the public works 
a threshold. Currently, our threshold when we do public works wouldn't mean any type of capital improvements that we would make to any of the facilities that we have in the corporation. There is a threshold of $150,000. That threshold means after you've reached that threshold, then you have to put out for uh, bid. And in this particular case, if that threshold were to be increased to $300,000, we would not have to go out to bid for those particular projects. Now, we certainly could continue to do that, uh, but by statute, we would not have to. So that's one of the things that I'm kind of following and very interested in. Another thing, as far as the House Ways and Committees meeting uh, committee is concerned, um, is House Bill 1499, which is this taxation of homestead property. And I'm going to get into that in just a moment. Uh, because that starts to play into our funding as far as our operations fund is concerned. But again, I'll get into that in just a moment. Uh, then also House Bill 1498, uh, which is the maximum operating referendum tax. So that's something else we're keeping a close eye on. If we were to go to referendum um, in, in particular statute, as far as this is concerned, there may be a maximum amount as far as those taxes are concerned. Um, but then getting back to, again, what I had mentioned, which is the uh, the homestead and the thing that that I wanted to bring to the board's attention is is currently as it stands with the homestead the property tax cap is one percent um, but going forward what they're looking at is actually reducing that amount which means that there would be less I mean, we could tax less or it'd be less than the one percent that we're at right now and what is looked to be done is, is actually going forward, and it would be at uh, 90, I think it's 97.5%, um, and then going forward again, I think it, it's down to 98%, but again, what that does is that lessens the amount that we're available to collect on our homestead property taxes. Again, that circuit breaker or that tax cap, if you will, is set at 1%. So that being put into place for those two years, we're looking at uh, less amount that we would be able to collect for, again, our operations fund. Uh, again, that is, that is a concern of mine as we go forward in, in looking at uh, those particular property taxes. Um, but then again, it's looked at, at after a 25, it would be boosted up again to 1%. But again, interested in following that uh, the other thing is the maximum growth quotient. The maximum growth quotient is the percentage that the Department of Local Government Finance will allow you to basically um, charge your operations fund. Uh, so in other words, we can increase it by 3%. That would be the maximum amount, and that is what they're looking to do. Just to give a little bit of perspective, the last time around, our maximum growth quotient was 5%. So we were receiving more. What they're looking to do would be maxing out. Now, that's not to say it's going to be 3%, but they're saying that they're maxing out at 3% uh, for our maximum growth quotient. And that would be for both uh, fiscal year 24 and fiscal year 25. So those, are again, are things that are keeping a very, very close eye on. Uh, some of the other things, of course, when it comes to uh, the education funding, Again, I just had it here. Um, would be looking at the overall uh, education budget uh, that would be put forth, and it looks as though it would be around a six percent increase in tuition support in uh, fiscal year 24, and um, a two percent increase in fiscal year 25. Now, I will say this, that doesn't say public education, that just says the education budget. So I'm not saying that is going to be going to uh, some charter schools or some of those outside of the public realm, but that is a very good possibility that would happen. Again, wanted the board to be aware of that. So these are a couple of things that, again, that I wanted to bring to the board's attention as we move forward. I encourage the board, and I'm sure you already are doing this, but as best you can to follow what's happening with the General Assembly. Um, a lot of questions that will come up. A lot of times, 
our legislators will reach out to whether it's the administration or board members getting their input as far as what is going on and to be very well versed as to what is happening as far as the General Assembly is concerned. It's very important in which to do that. Uh, one of the other things that uh, I did want to bring up too was Senate Bill, this is again with the Education Committee, Senate Bill 443. I'm going to read this to you. Um, and I, I want some clarification because it says provides that certain provisions in the bill regarding teacher compensation threshold requirements apply after June 30th of 2024. Uh, provides that after June 30th of 2024, a school corporation shall expend an amount for teacher compensation that is not less than an amount uh, equal to 62% of the state tuition support distributed to the school corporation during the state fiscal year. It includes school social workers and definitions of teacher regarding requirement. And again, I do believe that that is being brought, it's increased right now, we're at uh, a threshold where it's actually being increased. Uh, to bring into the benefits into that computation. It, it, that's the reason why it would be raised to 62%, although it doesn't state it as such in uh, the language that I have read this evening. But again, that would really be the intent. And again, that is Senate Bill 443. Um, so again, I wanted to bring those particular ones to your attention. Uh, anything that I do see on the fiscal side, I will certainly share with Dr. Francisconi, and, and he could be able to share with you in weekly reports if there's anything that is, uh, again, is pressing that our organizations are bringing forth as something to really pay close attention to. Uh, the other, uh, before I go, any questions on yes, assembly? Yes. Question, Greg. The, so the, the property tax relief, my understanding from reading about it was because the, the thought was uh, property values would be inflated. Correct. Have we been tracking at all the assessed values? Have our assessed values been inflating? They have inflated. Now, again, that inflation was based upon last year's AV. I've not had an update on where we're headed for in, as far as the potential of the future is, is headed. Okay. But again, that was the thought because there was an inflation. Our, our school corporation in particular inflated about 10% is where we were at as okay. far as AV is concerned. That was actually below the average of the state. And right. there were some school corporations that were around the 20, 25% increase in their AV. Uh, so as far as that is, is concerned, that was the consideration is, is the reason why that homestead uh, decreased as far as the cap's concerned. Right, and the challenge there is that you get used to getting that money and then it's gone. And so when you start to look at trying to sustain uh, salaries or increases, it makes it very difficult. Right. Um, so I know I know just about enough of what Greg's talking about to try to keep it as simple as possible, but a couple of things are really key that he's talking about here, including what you're presenting. The other thing too is that uh, what people don't often understand is that your tax dollars on your ho houses that are tied to your assessment, those only those funds only go to capital type of items. In other words, that's your operations, that's uh, utilities, it's anything with buildings, it's some personnel, it's all those things that are all of us are paying more for at home. And that the number that you can, um, the percentage that you can transfer in order to keep up with all those expenses is limited to 15%. So we take 15% as the minimum just to maintain things from year to year right. uh, and and then there's also a distinction between salaries and building buildings and maintaining buildings and so oftentimes we hear well how can they not pay salaries but they're building buildings well buildings are a totally separate fund and <coughs> done publicly as far as funding goes and bonds and so forth and so um, that has nothing to do with salaries and the last thing I would say is that they are it sounds like they're going to propose 62 percent as out of your operations fund spent towards uh, salaries and it's teacher salaries specifically. Correct, right? that would be the right. teachers, that, yeah, the teacher right. salary. And so we, is, they started at 45% because a number of school corporations weren't even spending 45% of their operations fund. Well, all along we've carried well, well above that. Uh, we're slightly above 55% actually right now, uh, but it sounds as if this continues, yeah. then we will have to be revisiting that one of the other things we've seen is that it could potentially already be higher than 57 because of uh, some things that we take on because with the LEA for special needs um, and some other positions that may or may not be taken taken into account with that. But we should be prepared for that if that comes up. Correct. And again, that 62% is really, what, what has been happening is 
<clears throat> we as business officials have had to report um, in fact, our second report is coming up here this week as far as benefits for teachers are concerned. So what they're doing is they're keeping track of, of what is being spent on an average of those benefits across the state to, to put into that, that calculation that then is that 62 percent. Uh, last thing on my report this evening is just a quick update on the transportation garage. Unfortunately, uh, Mr. Merkel from Larson Danielson. Thank you. Unfortunately, Mr. Merkel was under the weather this afternoon. Uh, reached out to me and, and let me know that uh, he was. Uh, but it is exciting to again to see the progression that is taking place with our transportation garage. Uh, this is the northeast corner building um, at the office vestibule, and so there are actual doors. There have been doors, but the windows have just been installed. So excited to see that um, a lot of work is taking place, which I'll show you here inside the office area. So you can see the studying taking place. Um, of course, you see again the windows there on the left hand side. Uh, interior office framing and again like I said the windows installed uh, I'm anxious to see uh, the update or to present the update next month because the drywall is starting to and I'll get to this in a moment uh, the drywall is, is being delivered which again I'll show you in a slide uh, it's not started been installed yet in the offices but again exciting to see that uh, right here you see the maintenance storage area so this is where um, our maintenance department will have their shop. We currently have a shop at the, the Rumley Street address or our SSC. Uh, it will be re relocated here, um, equipped with the equipment in which to um, equip our maintenance department to do all of the uh, work that needs to be done prior to going out to the buildings, uh, including welding. Uh, but there's plenty of storage space in here as well. Um, but very, very excited about the opportunity for our maintenance and utility staff to utilize this space here. Uh, this is a look inside uh, one of the bus bays and I, again you can start to see the progress there. Um, of course flooring has not been poured yet because of the temperatures. Uh, we were able to do that like we had mentioned at the last board meeting with our office space because we have temporary heating that is in that particular part of the building but with this uh, we're waiting until the spring in which to be able to pour that flooring but again progression is made you can see the lights here um, you can see the mezzanine there's work being done up here on uh, the mezzanine again excited to see that that uh, progression uh, I mentioned the drywall this is a picture here of some of the drywall being unloaded uh, again that will be hung in the office area and then as we look ahead uh, again, I'm really excited about the next board meeting, but looking ahead, we're looking at uh, the hanging of the drywall in the office area, like I mentioned. The mechanical equipment connections on the mezzanine, I pointed out that mezzanine area. Uh, we're going to continue to install the lighting, um, but the lighting is, is, has been a, a big benefit or a help as, as again, uh, the contractors have been working on uh, this particular project. And then the uh, grading work will start at Stevens Road. There's that improvement out there on Stevens Road. There's going to be a widening of that area for our buses, uh, an improvement on that particular road. Again, that work will start here very shortly. Uh, and again, start to install <coughs> underground utilities along Stevens Road. Again, continue to, uh, to progress and move forward. Uh, nothing at all is staying in our way of, again, completing this project on time uh, again so that we're able to move in and be ready to go to start that 23-24 school year exciting exciting to see it again if you have not been out that way to see the progression i do encourage you to get out there so and a big again big thank you to uh, uh larson danielson uh, who is the cmc for this project as well as schmidt and, and all the things that are going on to again make this uh, facility possible so questions Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hunt. That's my report. We'll move on to new business. The acceptance of gifts, donations, and the gift request. Uh, excuse me, the gift request. Dr. Francis Cohen. Thank you, President Arnold. In front of you tonight, donation of $200 from Mr. Mike 
Michael Kamrock, um, specifically the, uh, designated for Food Service Kindness Act that he is behind and supporting. Uh, the money will be used to pay off negative student uh, lunch balances, and so saving some some of the days for some of our students at the high school that are overusing their accounts. But with that, we uh, like to consider that for your approval and put that in front of you tonight. Board Chair Dr. Francis Coney, can I hear a motion? So moved. So moved. Second. 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 Motion second. No questions, comments. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Next, we'll list the consideration for the recommendation to renew the NIESC membership for the Port County School Port School Corporation Food Service. Mr. Hunt. Thank you, President Arnold. Uh, before this evening, in your board packet, you will see uh, the action item, which is the approval of the renewal of the uh, membership for the Northern Indiana Educational Services Center. Those of you that do not know about that particular uh, organization, uh, they work specifically with school corporations. Um, we are able to do a number of different things through Northern Indiana Educational Services Center. Uh, there are several school corporations that are part of this membership, and it's really to secure procurement for a number of different things. In this particular case, it is for food service. Um, and in fact, the rebates that we receive uh, from a couple of other items that we'll be bringing up in the next uh, agenda action item actually pays for this. Um, and then what happens is actually the price reduction that we get because of the procurement for our food service department actually then saves us more money on top of that. So again, rebates pay for it, and then those savings continue to help our food service department. But not only does our food service department, we as a school corporation have utilized Northern Indiana Educational Services Center in which to purchase a, a number of different products or, or supplies as well. Again, reducing those prices because of, uh, again, the number of uh, different school corporations that are included in that cooperative. So, again, this evening I ask the board approve the recommendation uh, to renew the membership for the Northern Indiana Educational Services Center in the amount of $21,210.15. Thank you, Mr. Hunt. The board's heard. Any questions, comments? Greg, what are some of the other items that like you might buy with this? I mean, there are a number of different things. Uh, we can go through and get um, copy paper, for instance. Copy paper would be one of those things. Uh, we bid those things out, and uh, again, there was a time this last school year that we saved a, you know, a considerable amount of money by being a member of the Educational Services Center, and then when we had those other quotes coming in, it was far under those other quotes. So that's just one of those ways. Uh, but there are a number of different things, like I said, supplies, but in, in majority of the reasons we use this particular organization is, again, for the procurement of our food service. Because it's a federally funded program, there are certain hoops that we have to jump through in which to secure our federal funding. One of those is which is the procurement, and this is one of those ways in which to procure and again, that organization is able to do that for us. If I could just add something to Mr. Seabury, they provide some academic programming for us as well. The textbook caravan that Dr. Larson mentioned earlier, they organize that. So they provide training, professional development for teachers, different licensing update. So we use them outside the business yes. office as yes. well. This is, this is more than food. Yes. Right? Oh, yeah. It encompasses an entire school corporation. Okay. Great. Including technology yeah. as well. Yes. We, we purchase all of our Zoom licensing through that co op as well. We actually also meet as a group. Um, all the technology directors of the NASC uh, meet on a regular basis as well. Thank you, Mr. Walter. Comments, questions from the board? You've heard the presentation by Mr. Hunt, Dr. Tanigal. I hear a motion to approve. So moved. So moved. Second? Second. Second. Questions or comments? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Consideration of the recommendation to approve the GPO food distributor, dairy distributor, and bakery distributor <coughs> for the Port Community School System Food Service Department. Mr. Hunt, you're on again. Thank you again, President Arnold. Uh, again, this is going to kind of line up with what we just did. So that membership through the Northern Indiana Educational Services Center provides us that, again, that avenue in which to procure. Uh, and this evening, uh, they, again, do all of that legwork for us. Uh, so what we're looking to do is approve uh, those particular vendors 
which again would be our uh, governmental publishing office, um, and then the bakery and dairy vendors for the upcoming year, which includes July 1 of 23 through June 30th of 2024. Um, and that would then uh, again procure the uh, food distributor, Alpha Baking Company uh, would be for our bread products, and then Prairie Farms for our dairy renewal. Um, the vegetables will be coming up, or the produce will be coming up at a later meeting, but this evening I'm just asking the board approve those particular vendors uh, for the 23-24 school year. For Mr. Hunt for a presentation, any questions or comments from the board? Motion? Thank you. Second? Second. Thank you. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Con uh, consideration for the recommendation to accept and award a farmland red rental bid. Mr. Hunt. Again, President Arnold, uh, at the last board meeting, uh, the board did approve for the advertisement for us to bid the farm property that is located, again, at that corner of 18th and A Street or across the street from the former Educational Services Center. Uh, we did run those advertisements on January 12th uh, and also on January the 19th, again, to keep in line with state statute as far as the, the bidding laws were concerned. Uh, we did hold a bid opening at 10 o'clock Central Time on Monday, February 6, 2023, here at the Educational Services Center boardroom. Uh, the bids were submitted as followed, and you will actually sit, see those bid forms in your, your packet as well. Uh, we received bids from Banwork Farms for $6,250, Andrew Minnick for $6,550, and Andrew Kramer for $7,000. And so this evening I'm um, asking for the board to approve the recommendation uh, to move forward with the leasing, leasing property. This is for one year, from March 1st, 2023 to February 28th of 2024 uh, to Adam Kramer, the amount of $7,000. Thank you, Mr. Hunt. The board heard the presentation. Questions or comments? Motion to approve. Thank you, Justin. Thank you. A second? Second, and we go on. Thank you. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? No. Okay. Again. Consideration for the recommendation to approve bid authorization and legal advertisement for the summer 2023 in the paving and traffic projects. Mr. Hunt. Thank you again, President Arnold. This evening, I want the board to understand that this is not an approval of a bid, but the bid authorization, meaning that you as a board are authorizing the school corporation to move forward in the bidding process, which includes the legal advertisement to do the projects out at Critchfield, uh, which is a traffic flow project as well as a paving project. We're gonna improve the traffic flow um, off of Johnson Road there at Critchfield. Very excited about the improvements that are gonna be made there, again, to improve that, that flow there, and again, improve the, the parking lot pavements as well. Um, then also, there's a portion on there just to bring the board's attention to improve our busing that comes in there. We're actually extending the parking lot out a little bit. It's, it's some of the buses are currently going off the parking lot in which to get in turn uh, to get the right radius to go in. So we're, we're improving that space there as well. At the high school, if you recall, we did a paving project or traffic flow project there last year. Uh, we were not able to complete all of the walkways around the high school at that time. This project would also be part of that as well. And then the other thing I'm excited about is the improvement of the lights in the parking lot, which would then make things brighter, uh, but also using LED for energy efficiency. Uh, so very excited about that. But this evening, I'm just asking that the board approve the authorization to bid for the Critchfield High School project. Thank you, Mr. Hunt. The board has heard the Mr. Hunt's presentation. Any questions or comments? I hear a motion to accept. So moved. Motion, second? Second. Second, thank you. All the favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed? Consideration for a recommendation to accept and award the Port County Community School Corporation audiovisual project. Mr. Hunt. Very excited about this particular project. This has been a long time in the making. Uh, I, I want to start off by commending uh, Mr. Walzauer and his team. Uh, we, we were blocked. To our attention, obviously, we have currently smart boards in a number of our different classrooms in the corporation. 
Those were purchased many, many years ago. Uh, they have become outdated. Uh, we want to improve upon the audiovisual experience for our students to enhance the instruction in the classrooms. This would be, a, except for Handley, which is a new building, uh, Kesslin Intermediate, as well as uh, at uh, Laporte Middle School, because of the projects and being newer, they have newer equipment in there. So we're looking at all the other elementary buildings in addition to the high school. Uh, but this evening, if you find in your packet, you will find a rundown of, of a number of different things. You'll see a letter from Mr. Waltower actually outlining the project in itself. Uh, again, this would be a projector screen, uh, as well as um, the uh, audio yeah, needs for those particular classrooms, those are all added in there. Uh, there is the RFP or that request for proposal that we have sent out. Um, we have the RFP that had been sent back uh, from Focus, uh, Focus AV bid, um, and then there is a bid matrix that is part of your packet as well. There's a rundown, and again, I commend Mr. Waltower for having all those details. We had advertised properly for this particular project. Again, we talk about public works and, and the threshold, what we need to do. Um, and then this would be ESSER funding in which to do this because it is improving um, in, with the learning loss and in, improving the overall experience of instruction in the classroom. So this evening, I'm asking the board approve um, the recommendation uh, for the, to accept the bid and award the bid from Focus Audio Video uh, for $830,470 for the work to be completed to update LPCSC classroom audiovisual equipment. This will be done before the beginning of the 23-24 school year. So again, very excited about that. Um, and we're going to obviously have to start before summer hits. And again, that will be some organization in the heart of Mr. Waltow and his team. But again, very excited about the improvements to our classrooms and in the way of this uh, particular project. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Walter, anything you'd like to add to that? No, I mean, this is a big project for us, obviously. This is a, a big step for the, um, I think, the experience of the classrooms. This, um, as we've all done one-to-one -one now, and we've really moved forward with one-to-one, -one, it's really moved the experience now to the actual child itself. Um, I think one of the things that we see a lot of um, complications in now, even, and I think back even to the days of when we were all in school, you know, the kids not seeing everything and when they're presenting up on the screen. Um, one thing that this does is actually puts a 119 inch diagonal screen in front of each classroom that is able to accommodate it. Adds uh, audio to classrooms that didn't have audio, uh, but also uh, kind of levels off the board for us because when we got into the COVID uh, time and we were awarded the gear grant, we got every teacher a uh, brand new laptop. One of the things, first things we found was that the smart boards, the resolution of the smart boards were four by three, like your old TVs they didn't match the newer technologies that we were getting out there. So this updates all of these across the board. The teacher's monitor is also updated to be uh, widescreen as well. The projector is a full HD projector, so it matches the same resolution as what the teachers are using, uh, but also is a very uh, bright projector. So kids anywhere in the classroom can see and be able to actually you know, see what's going on in front of the classroom. In addition, that mentioned that there is a, a handheld device by the teacher, that, so they do not have to sit at the, at the desk in which to operate that. They would be able to move around the classroom which should do that. Mike, this will uh, increase uptime too, right? Because yeah. if yeah. the well, smart boards go out there, go ahead. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. One of the things we do see right now, even with like the bed keyboards, is the, the time it takes to get the bed keyboards back from the uh, manufacturer if there is a warranty anything like that. Um, it also, as far as like if one goes down, all it is is either a projector replacement or a ball replacement. We can do that with one of our staff members or right now with any kind of bend do or any of those. It takes three of our staff members just to take it off the ball. Um, and it's been taking about three to five months just to get something back from warranty. So it, our biggest you know, thing is also being there and responding to the teachers and when they have downtime. We can't have a teacher down for that extended period of time. This allows our staff to be able to take care of things right away and be responsive when there are issues. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Any yeah. other questions, yeah. comments from the board? Every building except for Hanley, right? Because well, and then the Kesslin Intermediate. Oh, right. Yeah, the, the newer yeah. buildings through the last construction project. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. The ones that currently have, some high school don't have anything in their classroom, right. so elementaries have the smart board that need to be updated. So, yeah. Is there going to be like PD for teachers on how to implement? 
changes in the system. Yeah. In fact, they've already started some of that with the teachers and being able to introduce what those devices are going to look like. This actually is mirrored in our in a, if you go to our lab in our office, we mirrored this exact setup for the teachers last year. They kind of it's, have uh, groups of them come in. They were allowed to come in and take a look at the setup, uh, ask questions. Do that. We also talk about technology committee meetings as well. Uh, but yeah, we we've, we've actually got the exact setup actually in our lab to show them. Hey, this is how this is what the vision is. Any questions, comments from the board? If none, I will entertain a motion to accept Mr. Hunt's presentation and recommendation. So moved. So moved. Second. Second. Okay. Second. Thank you. Amy. <laughs> uh, motion and a second. All those in favor, by it, say aye. 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 Opposed. Consideration for recommendation, recommendation to approve the Fort Community School System Corporation video surveillance project. Mr. Hines. Keep moving along. Um, this evening, again, before you uh, in your packet, you will see a recommendation uh, for a security camera project. Uh, again, this has been some, some time in the making. Uh, it really does stem back again to uh, COVID and the traffic flow and the number of different activities that we are having around the building in, in which to secure our building. We wanted to put exterior cameras around the buildings that don't currently have exterior cameras. Uh, but the one thing that this is actually going to take it a step further, yes, we're going to be able to do that through this project, but the other thing we're going to be able to do is put it, everything on a one particular platform, which we have not been able to do. I'm going to go back again to the public works laws uh, those bids were going out and so when you bid some of those different projects out it may have different uh, vendors and so this again we're taking a look at everything and putting it on one platform one well, of the other things I'm very excited about is we have Kila Centuries in our buildings it will also be put on that platform as well um, and, and so the capabilities as far as the surveillance and those particular cameras are concerned and what we're going to be able to do and move forward is also going to be enhanced uh, again, because this is again pulling these things in as far as safety and things of, of because of what has happened through COVID, we're going to be using ESSER dollars in which to do this project. Uh, I, again, in your packet, and I commend Mike because he does a really good job of putting everything together. Uh, the advertisements, the bids, the requests for proposals, the matrix that we use in which to decide, and again, all of those are included with a letter from Mr. Waltower again to outline the projects in its entirety and more specific. Uh, but this evening that I'm asking that the, the board approve the bids as submitted and award to vid, Videotech uh, for $359,247.66. Uh, again, this project would be taking place over the summer. Thank you, Mr. Tom. Mr. Waltower, anything you want to add to that? Um, you know, our big focus was unifying the systems, um, and also right now the way we have it set up, um, this also will be able to allow us to move forward to some of our cybersecurity initiatives as well, uh, two-factor authentication. Um, but one of the things that we actually looked at really heavily was with our current platform, we're having to, when we work with first responders, we're having to really get with them more um, and explain how to set it up. Um, each server has its own IP address. We're having to, you know, really go through a lot more setup with them, where this will actually allow us to, with the first responders, um, sheriff's department, those, to be able to actually to say, here's a URL, here's your login, and away they go. Um, same thing with any kind of issues where, if, um, you know, we have a staff member that leaves for some reason, we can actually pull back that access, um, and they would they wouldn't have access to the camera systems anymore. Um, so there's a lot of more security side of things, but like we also said, it unifies also the door system. Um, that, that won't be right off the bat. We'll have to work towards that because this system supports it, but we have to do some conversion on the old system. Um, but it does allow us to move forward. Um, there's a lot more capabilities now in all these security camera systems now that uh, you're able to do, you know, tracking and those kind of things. If there was an event you needed to be able to do it. So. Any questions or comments from the board? Good work, Mike. You've heard the recommendation from Mr. Hunt, Mr. Walthour. Do I hear a motion from the board? So moved. Accept. So, so moved. moved. Justin, second. Second. Thank you, Jennifer. <laughs> we have a motion, to second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. Pass. Thank you very much.
you got to be quick over there, by the way. You're, learn, you're learning, aren't you? I am. <laughs> okay, consideration for the recommendation to approve the 2023-2024 and the 2024-2025 Port Community School Corporation school year calendars. Let's give Dr. Tynico a chance to speak. Here. All right, thank you. It's my privilege to be able to present to you a lot of work over the last three months that has gone into adopting the recommendation for two year calendar and so um, we engaged our district core team which represents school leaders from all different schools and departments um, they work on goals and, and guaranteed viable curriculum staff parent community engagement and safety and so uh, not a better group to represent this work than them because a calendar is more than just dates it, it reflects the structure and the delivery of our programs and our services for our kids and so it's a very complicated process there's never going to be a hundred percent consensus on, on everything you do in a calendar but we believe that we have some wins in this uh, recommendation for you including and I'm not going to have an all exhaustive list of these but uh, we really focus on balancing terms all right so we looked at instructional stretches for kids and students because one of the, the beauties of this process is we're going through strategic planning and we're on these tours in our buildings listening to our staff listening from to our constituents talk about their experiences in our schools and so one of the things that came up is, is wellness and mental mental health and looking at breaks and so we wanted to balance this calendar more so um, just just quickly we look we looked at I'm gonna give you some some numbers here uh, in this recommendation in the first year calendar we have 11 stretches and the average stretch of, of each one of those is 16 days if you compare that to this year's calendar in 22 23 there were 14 stretches of 12 and a half days so trying to get away from these long stretches short stretches and trying to even out as much as possible so that was one of the big drivers of this calendar we have a full week in there for fall or i'm sorry for thanksgiving break that was what we heard from our um, staff that it was important plus we reviewed data that showed that our attendance was really weak on short weeks especially around fall break and around Thanksgiving break uh, a two-year calendar helps our families and staff prepare two years in advance so we thought that was a benefit we listened and we removed uh, live e-learning days um, so our staff I think is really happy about that parents I think once they hear um, the outcome of this meeting if it's approved they will be glad about that as well we have uh, a big change for spring break, moving it from the first full week of April to the last week of March, and that's to better align with state testing. And as I mentioned earlier, the balance of the calendar um, throughout the year. And we also built in three staff days at the beginning of the year, a full day for parent-teacher conferences, and we're going to do district-wide open houses for our, all our schools. So previously, that was kind of left up to individual schools to work out in their calendar. This time, we are setting time aside, focus time, and doing it district-wide to ensure that um, it occurs in a systematic way um, across our schools and in the school year. So there are lots of other um, points to that, to that complicated process, but I just want to emphasize the involvement of our staff, the uh, listening that took place to try to improve upon um, the previous calendar, and there have been some changes due to that. I'd be glad to answer any questions. Question or comments from the board? So, Ben, what does that look like? So do you have meetings with all these folks? Is that how you solicit that information, or did you put out a survey? Or yeah, so our, our core team meets uh, once a month, the district core team, and we went through an activity we had guiding questions. We engaged them in questions to try to um, expand the perspective of the complication that is involved when you do a calendar. And so we asked that each building kind of mimic that activity, go back to their core team, and then produce um, some key takeaways. What are the themes coming up in each building? So then we analyzed those themes, those takeaways from all the schools and try to find commonalities across the board. And so you know things that uh, come up we want to go back to our notes and look was this a theme because we know you're not going to agree on on everything in this calendar but what were the, the main points of emphasis from the discussion from those those meetings that were guided by those important questions so we felt that really engaged people and made their voice heard um, some of the schools did do some surveys we did not formally do that from the from the district um, but again, doing the listening tour and strategic planning process right now, that also really gave us good insight into how our people felt about life, e-learning days, you know, vacations, and, and those sorts of things. So I've been on this job for one month and 13 days, right? And I have a whole new appreciation for schedules. 
Um, and the amount of effort you put into this is commendable. I, I, I really appreciate uh, what there's a lot of moving parts to this, like you said, and, and so I, I just commend you. Well, thank you. It's not perfect, and I'm not going to act like it's, it's perfect. We will reevaluate, but we thought having a two year calendar gives us a chance to really see the themes and the patterns that come out of it. So we will be hopefully bringing back to you some lessons learned um, here in a couple of years. So is it just one day for parent-teacher conference? Correct. That's what they're allotted? One day. Is there also um, another, I thought I read that there's another day, um, like in the during the day when school is taking place, is that correct? Uh, no, there's one full day set aside for parent-teacher conferences, that would be a no-student day, and so our intention is to schedule that across the district, so it might not be the traditional 7.30 to 3.30 hours, we might stagger it a little bit, so that way parents have some options in the evening, but it aligns to what we've previously done, we've done two evenings of, of half days, so now we're just, we're putting it all in one day, if that makes sense. So you've eliminated scheduled e-learning days. Correct. So well, one of the big outcomes of that is what will we be doing when we have inclement weather and we plan to do posted e-learning days. We get up to three right now. If that were to increase, we would also tap into whatever the state would allow. And after that, it would be made up on in, in person at the end of the school year. So, so posted e-learning day is where you post the homework assignment for the kids to do. It's not necessarily instructional, so it's not a Zoom. Yeah, they're not right. live where okay. there's a Zoom. They're, their information is posted, I think, by 9 a.m. is what our, gotcha. our plan states. Questions and comments from the board? But they would still have live um, e learning days as well? No, there are Not no live e learning days built into this calendar. Okay. Yeah. Some of the recent feedback that you guys received after meeting with reps, anything, any takeaways from that information from the teachers regarding reps those as in the association? The association. Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, so the fall break previously was a two-day fall break for staff and students, and we had parent-teacher conferences on the back end of that, so it would have been only one day for staff. We met with the LFT, and again, looking at themes, can't do it all. One of the themes was we want to move that date off of, parent, or off of fall break, so we moved that to September uh, 25th, which is the fourth Monday in September, so that would be a day off for students, all-day parent-teacher conference. The consequence of that is it's a one-day fall break for staff and students. The payoff is you get a full week of Thanksgiving break. We're not able to do a two-day fall break and a full day of Thanksgiving break and still keep those semesters balanced. It's important that we have somewhat of a balance. I believe in this current um, iteration it's a 92-88 split um, with the, or 88-92 I believe, uh, with the second half of the year being usually more because of state testing and you have some other interruptions like weather and, and that sort of thing. So we're trying to keep a balance. Um, and it's, it's a, a domino effect, you know, it's a ripple effect. When you move one thing, it has a, uh, a carryover effect on the rest of the calendar. So that's, that's uh, what we did to that parent-teacher conference day. Got it off that Monday after a fall break. So that Monday now is a student and staff day. We put it in the middle of the month of September because also the feedback we had prior to that was about the timing of the, of the parent-teacher conferences. Some of them were in favor of it being in the middle there was a chance for parents to have a chance to work with their children to get their grade up before the end of the nine weeks. Others were saying they liked it at the end of the nine weeks. That's why we put it where it was in the first place. And since we were going to move it, we said we're going to go back to, it was pretty much 50-50, went back to the middle of the first nine weeks. So there's overall less time on these next two years for parent like scheduling-wise, for parent-teacher conferences, or is it all just one whole day? Yeah, it's the same amount of time it's as previous years. It's just yeah. one day, not okay. split up into two evenings. And the challenge, too, is there's so many differences between elementary and secondary regarding parent t conferences. Yeah, and just as a parent with elementary kids, it's a rat race as it is. You, know, you get yeah. in, you sit down for 15 minutes, you hear everything, yeah. and you're gone. So I'm just trying to... We're trying to also hand off in this day and age regarding it's kind of like progress reports. Those are archaic, right? And so you're trying to move forward and say, you know, there are so many ways technology-wise that we can keep up with and, and meet or discuss or have dialogue with parents rather than this one magical day with all of our technology. You know, think about it years ago, it, it didn't, none of it existed and you still have parent-teacher conference. Well, we still have them, um, but they're all, uh, you know, there's so much to do electronically and not to substitute for dialogue, uh, but there are people that, um, and parents that we definitely 
want to and need to be speaking with and, and others probably some ways we can do things outside of that window so it's not just that particular day uh, to get updates but, sorry. oh I'm sorry the uh, second semester goes after winter break right so it ends or I'm sorry first semester so it ends January 12th 12th yeah any concern about like final exam scheduling and kids having been off for two weeks prior to that for secondary or just um, we, we talked with the high school okay. about that um, not, not really okay. final exams aren't traditionally like they used to be final exams yeah. um, we have a staff records day on that Monday following the semester that's why there's another quick break there so not a real great stretch right there as you can see we talked about stretches earlier um, but no we engaged the high school on that Mr. Up and his team is well aware of it. as long as they know in advance they can plan sure. okay. a lot of projects a lot of courses have more projects now at the end of the year rather than a, a summative exam yeah. lastly I would say we have an FAQ document for our staff for our families and then for you and those all are a little bit tailored towards the audience we'll post that on our school website with these calendars once they're approved so that way we, our families can kind of look at questions that everybody's wondering about some of these are really good questions and it gives some of the explanation or rationale behind each question Other questions or comments for the board do what, I hear a motion I, I do have a question sorry mm -hmm. what this may be getting the cart in front of the horse but when will we start the next one do you do, do will we do a, a one-year add-on or is it always a two-year block two years so it is okay yeah, so we'll look at December get my dates right here of the second year so 2025 is it okay you gotta look at that we'll start in that November December time period and then bring a recommendation to you sometime yeah, in the so just kind of like now, just two years next time. yeah okay. yeah right. we won't do a rollover we'll just do the two years and then we'll look to do another two-year calendar depending on the feedback and how it goes right. Sorry. I hear a motion to accept you have hey, another question, question. Right. Is there any state assessment, you know, with the assessment windows, is there anything that you guys noticed previously that we weren't getting assessments completed in time, students weren't having the assessment time needed to complete assessments, removing the break oh, over? That it was, it was a problem before? That it was a problem, that it was impacting testing. No, it's just it's jamming. You have variables like weather, and so you end up jamming in. We don't like testing on Friday, so you just start to whittle down really quickly what is possible. Um, and those state testing schedules change, too. I did look back at how our calendar aligned with the state testing schedules, and we took a more thorough look at that. Um, so it's hard to say when they're going to uh, release a schedule. This year, it just happened to fall in that first week of April um, for the IM test, I believe, is the first one that starts there. So you have to look at... Um, lots of factors including when your kids come back do you want them testing you know right away on that Tuesday after spring break probably not so no we, nobody was left out of testing we, we still strive for the hundred percent mark for all our all our testers we heard test exhaustion by students and trying to look at you know the window of time which we test try to jam it all in a week and then uh, the frustrations that come with that so you know nothing was foolproof regarding the thoughts but we did hear things and try to take that into account when we're looking at this window thinking that if you have the whole month in the case of iLearn then you certainly have plenty of time to do some lead up activities to test and spread it out and to also to c catch up on the makeup work or the makeup testing that needs to happen all within that window. We're, we're testing more as well we tested our second graders and I read three so that's a new addition um, and then our NWA formative assessments that we do there's probably more discussion around those in the spring than there is around the state testing you know when do you put the formative assessment in you want your your kids to be able to be on their their best testing performance and we have the formative assessment that you can either do before the state testing or you can do after but either way that test fatigue is going to come in so again looking at how do you get all of this in into a limited amount of time we feel that this is a, an option that we want to try for two years comments I'll entertain a motion to accept Dr. Tonico's presentation to accept and approve the 2023-24 and 2024-25 school calendar. So moved. So moved. Yeah. Second. Yeah. I have a motion and a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
consideration for the recommendation to approve non-certified staff raises. Dr. Tyler. All right, it's another privilege of mine to be able to present to you a recommendation for employee raises. Um, all employee groups are, be, are being considered for a raise this year, so that is a really good thing and hopefully we'll go a long ways in making our staff feel appreciated and retaining them. This process began in the fall with our teachers, not because they're the most important group, they're very important to us, but it's um, that timeline is um, uh, guarded by uh, state, um, state code. So kicked off with them, then we went on to our custodial group, our maintenance group, we looked at substitute teachers, and now here we are looking at our non-certified staff. So in front of you, there's a pay schedule that has the ranges for different employee groups. It involves a lot of employees, and we are recommending a 4.5% increase for those groups, which is in alignment with the other groups that have already received their raises. With the exception of the bus drivers. With the, thank you, Mr. Hunt. With the exception of the bus drivers, which that process will go through negotiations. Thank you. Questions, comments from the board? Any second to absorb this? While you're looking at that, I want to point out two other important pieces to this recommendation. We are looking to create more consistency with our working schedules for our paraprofessionals. There are some that are at six hours a day and some of them at six and a half. We are recommending that all will go to six and a half hours per day so we get them all on the same uh, working schedule. In addition to that, we increase or recommending an increase in leave benefits to five additional days of paid time off for those employees and we believe that by doing that it can lead to better retention for our staff and both of those um, benefits we are recommending start in 23-24 and that's due to just the logistical things involved in payroll and in our, um, in our Skyward systems. I give uh, Dr. Tonegal and his team credit for looking at this because the other thing we did is to look specifically at why it is that we have salary structure the way it is. Um, not that it's always been this way. If we can't explain why it's that way, then we need to revisit it. We asked ourselves that question in a number of cases. Um, why is this job in relation to this one a different pay? Um, certainly none of them are where we'd like for them to be um, in education, but if there's a difference between them, you know, why is that? And then I think the other thing, too, that we're looking at closely is within these groups, make it clear to what those salaries are, why they're where they're at, and how it is that some, some of them, some of our staff, can move and aspire to improve their education and experience, understand what it takes to get to that ne next level, uh, because most of the, the positions that are uh, differentiated uh, from one to the next have something to do with education experience certification, which is what we're all about as educators. Another big um, data point that went into the why was we have an analytics program just like we do for our academics. We have a dashboard for um, wage and, and that sort of thing that we could pull comp data from other corporations in our northwest Indiana area, even, even northern Indiana, and we did even look at uh, corporations across the state that were similar to us. So if we saw high turnover in a certain area, so we were kind of curious, are we just really off right there? We were able to pull those analytics and um, compare. Are we just too low? Are we too high? So that also went into this factor of the recommendation before you. Question or comments from the board? I see the preschool facilitator. Is that considered the preschool teachers? Yes. Yeah. And um, are they contracted? No, they're not. Positions that are grant funded, we have some literacy coaches. They're also licensed teachers. They're um, funded by a grant, so due to budgeting, they're not contracted people, even though they're licensed people. Are we having issues retaining them? Yes and no. Um, there, it's a feeder system for our classroom, so we end up hiring a lot. It's very common for us to hire a pre-K facilitator. They're a part of our corporation. They work with our teachers, and then when there's an opening in classroom, they move on. So like Dr. Francisconi's talking about, that kind of feeder program. Um, but there, it is one of the positions that turns over a lot, much like our literacy coaches or academic coaches. We don't lose them to other corporations. We lose them to ourselves, so kind of a good thing. And one other thing, the uh, bus, the bus drivers. Um, when when are we looking at those? Uh, their the negotiations will be starting up next week with okay. the bus drivers. Okay. We haven't even started negotiating yet. And that's duly 
agreed upon as far as when the start time is? We'll have a letter that goes out pending your approval of this recommendation to our staff who are affected by this, much like we did at our last board meeting that went out and explained what was approved and who was involved. And regarding the preschool, one of the challenges, as Dr. Tonigal said, is it's grant-funded title grants, right? And so not all of, our, all of our schools are eligible for that. So those schools are able to provide preschool funded by Title I to cover the cost of those staff members with that designation uh, that they have as not being, um, you know, a part of the association and not being on a uh, contract. Uh, but other than that, we have two schools that do not get money and we don't get state funding for preschool. And so therefore, we pay for the fees for parents for those two programs or three uh, through a grant, uh, a gift actually yeah. that we have uh, across the corporation. So yeah, we're. We're proud to offer it. We were one of the first schools to do it. Um, but again, because of the way it's funded, it's um, soft money right now, and we, we have to be guarded about uh, how we manage that. A question or comment from the board? Seeing none, I'll uh, accept a motion to approve Dr. Tyler's presentation on non certified staff raises. So moved. Oh, thank you. Second. Second. All those in favor signify by aye. 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 Opposed? Very good. The uh, last consideration for the recommendation to approve administrators and directors raises. Dr. Tonico. Thank you, President Arnold. Again, this is uh, very similar to our other units that have gone through the process of receiving raises. We have our administrative schedule in front of you that outlines a range for each principal, uh, director, assistant superintendent. It's got all our positions in our corporation. Uh, a 4.5% increase is also added on this spreadsheet so that you can see where it falls in relation to other positions. A lot of work goes into this to uh, ensure alignment both vertically and horizontally. We also use programs like our analytics program just to compare um, how our positions are paid compared to other corporations. And so um, I ask that uh, the administrators be approved for the raise as written under schedule. For Dr. Ponigal's presentation, any board comments, questions? Motion to approve Dr. Ponigal's recommendation. Thank you, Rhonda. Nice to see you. Have a second? Second. 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 Okay, thank you. Motion second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Thank you. Now, other business? We have any other business brought before the board this evening? Board comments? Yes, sir. I would be remiss not to point out that one of the Hall of Fame inductees is sitting next to me. <laughs> Marie, congratulations. Oh, I it was Jim. Yeah. <laughs> so, congratulations. Thank you. I was going to bring it up when I, I said, I'm make a motion. <laughs> well, congratulations, Lee. Long time ago. And you know what? Probably, and I'm just throwing this out there. Has there ever been an induction where a, a, a husband and wife are inducted the same night? Yes. There, there has? Mr. and Mrs. Goad. Oh. Oh. Who was that? Mr. and Mrs. Goad. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I years ago. Not being a slicer, but being a red man. <laughs> <laughs> well, congratulations. Well, Oh, Any other board comments? And just a couple real quick things here. Uh, do we need to schedule an executive session? Yes. Okay. I'd like to schedule an executive session and then also a work session for some uh, topics that we need to discuss. Those, of course, work sessions are distinguished from executive in that executive have a list of specific items that you can discuss or should discuss and must discuss behind closed doors, whereas work sessions are almost lot of other items that we'd like to discuss that public can attend uh, but not participate in. Okay, is there a certain time frame that you're looking at? We or? can send something out. Um, we usually try to either do those in conjunction with a board meeting and or um, a Monday night since that seems to be the nights that we're, we're wanting to meet. So I would suggest that we throw a couple dates out and try to 
try to schedule those? Let me just throw something out here. A week from tonight is President Day. I don't know if any of you go to Washington for special <laughs> for the President's Day, is that is that? That's a Monday on the 20th. Tammy can throw out a couple days okay. and kind of do a survey poll and find out who's available. Um, it will be a 5 o'clock start for those, I can say that, and then just the dates will vary. I will say one thing. I'm really, really tickled with the response of the board. If this board responds when I send yeah. something out, I, go, well, I can tell if they're really working or not. <laughs> so I, I appreciate the quick response that everybody sent me. Um, Again, I want to remember, remind people that we haven't reached the halfway point of the legislative session yet. There's still a lot of bills out there floating around, you're reading about and so forth. Don't get too nervous yet because we've still got a lot of, lot of work to be done before the bills are voted out and finally go across the, to the other chamber. So read about it, keep up the data on it, but don't, don't get too shook up yet. Wait until halfway point of the session and we'll start, to start getting uh, serious about it. Uh, Vice President Sieber and myself will be attending the uh, State School Board Association Day at the State House next Tuesday. It's an opportunity to be your first one and an opportunity to go down there and see what, the, what they actually do in the State House. You may be happy, you may be disappointed. You know? What's up? Well, we'll see. But we'll be down there next Tuesday for the day at the State House and he'll, he'll come back and report to you when we get down there. Um, uh, Oh, I wanted to bring up, if you remember last month, I held off an appointment to the Regional, the, uh, re, the, the uh, Develop, re, Development Commission of Laporte County. And I have decided to appoint or make my recommendation to have Rhonda uh, serve on that board. I talked to uh, Christian President uh, uh, Haney the other day and we had a discussion. They called me back later that night and found out that the commission has to actually accept the appointment or vote on the appointment. So we sent a formal letter requesting that, that uh, Rhonda be our appointee, and I just, that's the only one we sent. So they, they either accept or they don't. Right? No, no exception. <laughs> so the, the commission meeting is Wednesday night at 6 o'clock. So hopefully they'll be notifying us Thursday morning, Sunday, whether you'll be on there. But uh, you're going to have a lot of fun. It's, a, it's really an interesting board. Right. So I'm so happy you accepted that assignment. And, uh, Amy and Jennifer and Justin, thank you for your response to me, which we'll talk after the meeting real quick about serving on this other committee. So having said that, I want to thank everybody for attending tonight and the no other business, no other comments. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. So moved. Second. Second. Come on, Amy. You guys gotta go faster down here. <laughs> <laughs> a motion to uh, adjourn and second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Meeting adjourned. Thank you. Hey, don't run off. There might be papers to sign for.